Hi everybody, this is uh, Dr. Mukhopadhyay. We are going to go live soon uh, with this uh, with the pathology lecture that was planned and we're just trying to set up things now and make sure that uh, everything is good to go. To those who are coming in, Lara, I know you, I, I see the other, that you're already here. Welcome, guys, we're live. Okay. So, Emily, you'll run it for me? Yep. Okay. So, you can come in here and run it. And we'll start, and as the residents come in, they can come in. So, for those who are joining right now, welcome for, for whoever is coming in from all over the world. So, we are doing just a basic pathology lecture for our residents, but um, anybody from all over the world who's joining us on Periscope is welcome to, to come. Um, this talk is going to be about adenocarcinoma of the lung, and we are going to give you six facts, not all of which you'll find in a standard journal or a pathology textbook, but are given from the point of view of a, a lung pathology expert. Again, we are broadcasting live. Um, those of you that uh, already follow me, it's great. Uh, but those of you who do, do want to learn lung pathology, there's a lot of lung pathology education going on on Twitter. Uh, and my handle, as uh, some of you know, is SM Lung Path Guy, and you can follow. We post a lot of pictures there. We post uh, uh, board, uh, you know, things that are important for the boards. And we also have a hashtag not, known as Know or Fail, which is absolutely essential things that you must know for the boards that everybody should know. So we're going to get started um, with this lung pathology lecture that's broadcasting live to everybody around the world. Come in, guys. We're we are live and we're broadcasting. All right. So Emily, can you? Uh, so Emily is our chief resident, and she's going to help me with advancing the slides because I'm actually close to the phone, uh, talking into it, so everybody can hear. Uh, Lara and those that are hearing um, on Periscope, could you just let me know in the comment section that you can hear me? Can somebody comment in there and just let me know if the visual quality and sound quality is good? I see that 20 of you are there already. Actually, there's more people on Periscope than there are in the room here. <laughs> so already. <laughs> All right. So the, yes, that's great. Thank you very much. All right. We'll get started. So the first thing I just want to let you know is before we go into the six essential facts, I want to um, give a brief introduction to the 2015 WHO classification, which is the blue book that we know and love. So the, the WHO classification is out. This, this is a new classification. Lots of things have changed. So everybody who, every pathology resident who wants to learn about lung pathology should read this new 2015 WHO book. You must read this book. Things have changed. And lung tumors uh, are now classified as epithelial tumors, mesenchymal tumors, lymphohistiocytic tumors, tumors of ectopic origin, and metastatic tumors. So that's the broad classification that the WHO uses in this latest classification. And epithelial tumors, now interesting from my point of view, I had always, you know, my conception of epithelial tumors was small cell versus non-small cell. That's how I broadly described it. But in the new WHO, that's kind of, that's gone away. So non-small cell, they don't even really use that term in a heading anymore. There is such a thing. I mean, you, you do, there are, tumors that are broadly grouped together as non-small cell carcinomas, adenocarcinoma, squamous, large cell, but they don't actually use that term in any chapter as a heading. So non-small cell is, they're trying to, I think, phase out the indiscriminate use of that term. So what they do is they divide epithelial tumors into adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, neuroendocrine tumors, and many other tumors, which I don't want to list here because it'll be too busy of a slide. Next, please, Emily. So adenocarcinoma pathology, you know, what you should know for sure is that feelings are not in us, right? You don't, you, you shouldn't tell me, I think this is adenocarcinoma because I just have a feeling that it's glandular. <laughs> I don't want feelings. <laughs> One of my uh, attendings used to tell me, you know, they tell me, you're too young to have feelings. <laughs> so no feelings, we need criteria. So the criteria should be either the tumor makes glands or the tumor makes mucin or shows pneumocyte marker expression. So pneumocyte marker expression is a thing that's been added in the new classification. In the previous one, there was no such thing. There was either glands or mucin, and there was no other way. And what they mean by this is that you can have, if, you, if in a poorly differentiated tumor, if you have TTF or napsin expression, then that qualifies as an adenocarcinoma, even if it doesn't have glands or mucin. Does everybody understand that? So even if you don't have glands or mucin, just if you have 
neurocyte marker expression, which is either TTF or NAPSIN, then that is um, that is uh, fulfills criteria for adenocarcinoma of the lung. Now the growth patterns, everybody knows, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but adenocarcinomas can grow in many different patterns. It doesn't mean that these are specific types of adenocarcinoma, okay? So it doesn't mean that lipidic adenocarcinoma is a different animal than acinar. In fact, many different patterns are frequently present in the same tumor. As those of you who have signed out with me and have done resection specimens, you know that in the same tumor, you can have acinar pattern, lipidic pattern, micropapillary, papillary. So these are just growth patterns that adenocarcinomas have. And they certainly do, there is some prognostic significance to them, but we're not going, going to go into that. Next, please. So here's an example of an acinar pattern. So the arrows show you the tumor cells are making glands. And there's nothing in the middle of those glands. Now, if they're tufted cells in the lumen of those glands, you should be thinking micropapillary pattern. But if those glands are surrounded by uh, neoplastic cells and there's an empty space in between, no papillae, then that is called acinar pattern. The neoplastic cells make glands. Next, please. And then here are the other patterns that everybody should be familiar with. The top left is the papillary pattern where you have a fibrovascular cord. You actually have a fibrous thing. Thank you for pointing it out, Emily. So there's a fibrous thing there and then uh, capillaries and you know as blood vessels. Then on the top right, you have micropapillary, which is these tufted cells falling into the air spaces. And those of you who have done bladder pathology before you did lung pathology, you might think, hey, that's not micropapillary or breast. You'd, you'd say, no, micropapillary is, it, it looks like it's within lymphatics and there's all these little tumor, but that's not, in, in lung pathology, we do it a little differently. So for us, micropapillary is these little tufted clusters of cells that look like papillary structures, but they don't have a fibrovascular core. And they just float off like that into the air spaces. Malignant cells floating into the air spaces like that without a fibrovascular core. So that's our micropapillary pattern. And then the bottom left is the lipidic pattern. We're going to talk a lot about this. And what that is, is tumor cells basically growing along pre-existing alveolar septa. Just imagine, it's like, like Spider-Man crawling up a wall. It's like the wall is there, it's not being destroyed. It's just grow, going on the surface of the, of the alveolar septa. So that's what the lipidic pattern uh, is. And on the bottom right is the solid pattern. So this is the pattern that if you didn't have TTF or NAPSIN, you wouldn't know what this is, right? Because there's no glands, there's no mucin, and there's no way to know whether that's adenocarcinoma or not. In the past, I'm sure many of these were misinterpreted as squamous cell carcinomas, but that's the solid pattern. So we're going to start with our must-know facts. There are six facts I'm going to teach you today. I hope you go away with six things, take-home facts from this lecture. The first fact is, in a lung biopsy, so in a small biopsy, like a transbronchial or endobronchial or corneal biopsy, many adenocarcinomas can be diagnosed where we're live and broadcasting live. Uh, many adenocarcinomas in lung biopsies can be diagnosed without even a single immunostain. I'll repeat this because for many people this comes as a shock to their system. I'll repeat this. For many lung cancers, adenocarcinomas in small biopsies, you can diagnose them without doing even a single immunostain. All right, so let's explain what that means. Here's an example of a lung biopsy. This one ha happens to be a core needle biopsy. And you can see that there's tumor here, right? There are malignant cells here. Some of them have intracytoplasmic mucin. Maybe, Emily, you can uh, point that out. So intracytoplasmic mucin in some of those, some of them don't. You can see at the top left of the picture, there's a micropapillary falling off of the cells into the lumen to the left, yeah, like those guys. So this is clearly malignant, right? There, there are malignant cells here. They are uh, arranged in glandular patterns that are malignant. Next, please. So the two things that you need for adenocarcinoma, gland formation, actually you also have mucin production, and then malignant cells. Those, those are clearly present. Next, please. You even have, and this is not very common, you even have a desmoplastic stroma. So you have a stromal reaction to it. So really, this is an adenocarcinoma open and shut, right? But many people would be, would be hesitant here. I know this from experience, from doing 10 years of consults. People are hesitant. They say, well, I don't know. Could this be a metastasis from the pancreas? Could it be from the GI tract? Could it be this? Could it be that? And so then come the barrage of stains. So it's CK7, CK20, TTF, CDX2. And then when the TTF is negative, you're stuck, right? Because you say, well, the TTF is negative. I don't know. Maybe uh, I should hedge it. Maybe I should say clinical correlation is recommended. <laughs> But that is exactly the wrong approach. 
you don't need to throw a bunch of stains on something just because there's a fu slightly funny look. So next please. So the bottom line diagnosis, how I do it, and many of you have seen me do it, the bottom line diagnosis here is adenocarcinoma, open and shut. So do we need to do anything else? Let's see, what are our options? Our options are we could do stains, right? We could do a CK7, 20, TTF, napsin, try to quote unquote prove that this is lung cancer. We could do a TTF and P40 trying to subtype, but do we need to do that? Do we need to subtype this? Guys, do we? No, no. we don't. We already know it's adenocarcinoma, so we don't need that. Do we need to check history and radiology? Yes. yes, that's what I would do. Next, please. Or do we just sign it out, sign it out and send it for molecular testing? We could, but I try, I try to check history and radiology. Next, please. So that's my approach to this. I check the history and I'm not looking for whether the ant died of bladder cancer and whether he has a cat in his house and whether, you know, he, I'm not looking for all of that. I'm just looking for whether there is a history of malignancy in a different organ. All right, especially carcinoma. So here's my approach to this kind of case, a carcinoma in a lung biopsy. We know it's not small cell from the morphology. So here's my approach. I, my first question is, is it clear on H&E whether the tumor is adeno or squamous? And if it's clear, that's on the, on the left side. If it's clear, I don't do any immunostic chemistry for subtyping. Do you understand that, guys? No need for immunostic chemistry. On the right side is a poorly differentiated tumor where it's solid and there's no glands or mucin. In that, I do do immunohistochemical stains for subtyping and I do TTF and P40. The next question I ask myself is, do I even need to address the question whether this is lung cancer or not? In the vast majority of cases, you don't need to answer that question. In other words, if there's a, not a history of carcinoma at another site, there's really no need. There's no need to even go to that question. So I do not do immunohistochemistry with only rare exceptions, which I'll talk about. On the other hand, if there is a history of carcinoma at another site, so let's say the, um, uh, the pathology report says, rule out metastatic breast cancer. Sure, I'll think about it, right? And I consider doing stains for breast, I might do a GATA3 and ERPR and so forth. If somebody says there's a history of colon cancer, I might consider that, but I use the morphology in that setting to guide me further. So if there is a history, I certainly go further. If there isn't a history on the form, I would like you guys to look up the history, right? Because we have access to the history. And if you don't look it up, I look it up myself. So I, I do go that extra mile. Now I do realize that there are people who practice in situations where they don't have access to the history, right? They're in a reference lab or some kind of, you know, some, whatever setting that they they're, might not have access to the medical records. And that they will be in trouble if they, you know, if you, if you can't, uh, and they might be doing excess immunostains just to compensate for the fact that they can't uh, access the history. But if you do have access to the medical record, you should look this up, okay? Is that clear? Next, please. So do I use morphology? Of course I do, right? If, some, if something looks like a clear cell carcinoma, of course I ask myself the question, could this be a met from the kidney? But what do you do next? You look for the history, right? So you, so you are back to, the, to that stream, you must know whether there's a history of carcinoma somewhere else before you start to throw stains on it. So in this kind of a case, I might do a TTF1 and a Paxate to differentiate those two. Next, if I see this, you know, there's dirty necrosis at the top right. There is palisading malignant cells at the bottom left. So yes, I will look at this and I'll say, well, could this be colon cancer? But then I look at the history. So again, history becomes the, the critical feature there before you start to throw a TTF and a CD, CDX2 on a case like this. All right, next please. So here, I'm just recapping the, the bottom line for this. The bottom line is, for many adenocarcinomas in, in lung biopsies, you can diagnose them without doing even a single immunostain, all right? Now, this doesn't apply to metastases to the brain or liver or bone or other situations where you might need to do immunostains. I'm talking solely about lung biopsies, where the mass is in the lung, you already know that. So um, you, you can do that without even a single immunostain. So questions, anybody, any of our residents? Questions, comments? Anyone, Chuck, anything uh, to add to that? I would just echo you can do all of that on cytology too. Yes, and all of that on cytology. <laughs> exactly, all of that on cytology too. That's a great point. All right, so let's uh, move on just to um, uh, tell you all of you guys. So there are 44 people already watching all around the world on, on Periscope. So this is, you know, you are learning and they're learning as well. Everybody's learning together. All right, so let's go to the, um, to the next must know fact. So you must know in 2016, when you're training in pathology, that the term bronchial alveolar carcinoma, or BAC, is obsolete. 
do not use that term anymore. It's actually been obsolete since 2011, since the, um, the ISLC ATS ARS statement came out. So this term has been replaced by other terms and you must never use it whether on cytology or on, on small biopsies or, or on dissection. Never use this term. All right, so we'll talk about this for a second. So here is an example of a patient who has bilateral consolidated pneumonia-like masses on both sides. Could this be cancer? Could, could it not be? Could it be something infectious? Those are all good thoughts. But the biopsy there on the, on the lower left side shows a mucinous type tumor with a lipidic growth pattern. And you might think, well, I've read somewhere that lipidic has a great prognosis. So could this be adenocarcinoma in situ if it's, if it's lipidic? No, it's not. So in the, in the current um, WHO classification, this is called invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma, even if it is lipidic, even if, it's, if it looks a lot, uh, has a lot of lipidic growth pattern. Why? Because these tumors frequently also have invasive growth. They behave in an invasive fashion. They are frequently multifocal and bilateral and often have a poor prognosis, just like any other invasive adenocarcinoma. So don't be fooled by the lipidic growth in these cells. The mucinous quality of the tumor cells is very important in this situation. So you shouldn't even be thinking adenocarcinoma in situ if you see a mucinous tumor, even if it has a lipidic growth pattern. Now clinicians think of BAC in a different way. They think of something that looks like a pneumonia but actually is cancer. Some of them are mucinous and some of them are not. So BAC was a term that created a lot of confusion in the old days. Cytologists thought of it differently. They thought of it as a tumor that is a, a, has a very bland looking appearance and is adenocarcinoma. We thought of something as BAC as something that had a lipidic growth pattern. Clinicians thought of BAC as something that looks like a pneumonia but is cancer, and they didn't correlate. In the vast majority of cases, there was, there was a you know, discrepancy between these things. So now the WHO has separated mucinous uh, BAC, which is now called invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma, from the non-mucinous types, which we'll talk about. Next, please. So, uh, so this is what the mucinous one looks like. It grows along the alveolar septa in, an, in a, a lipidic pattern, but in other areas you might find an acinar pattern or a micropapillary pattern. Next, please. And this is the new name to give it. Is that clear to everyone? Invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma. Even if you don't see overt invasion, this is still an invasive tumor and behaves really badly. In fact, the, the picture that I showed you, that, that had, a, had a fatal outcome. It's, very, it's a very aggressive tumor. Next, please. So here's the other side of the coin. This is a, what used to be called non-mucinous BAC in the old days. So ignore the, the white haze that's in the background, just look at the nodule, okay? So the haze is not tumor, only the nodule. So that nodule is a ground glass, small nodule in the lung parenchyma. It's a solitary nodule. And when you biopsy it, if you find that kind of a thing, which is a non-mucinous lipidic growth pattern, then it depends on whether you're looking at a small biopsy or you're looking at a resection. But this is clearly in a different than the previous case I showed you with the multifocal bilateral tumors. Next, please. So the, I want to make myself clear here. And for that, I'll use the help of a celebrity. So next, please, Emily. Anybody know who this guy is? <laughs> All right. I do not want anybody to diagnose BAC anymore on any kind of specimen. Is that clear to everybody? That's an obsolete term and don't use it. All right, next. So this, this is the must-know fact. The term BAC is obsolete. I'm going to talk about non, the non-mucinous form soon, but anybody have any questions about the mucinous form of BAC, about what we should do with it? All right, so don't, don't call it adenocarcinoma inside. Now the third, now our third um, must-know fact is that lipidic growth pattern is common. You see it in all kinds of specimens, in small biopsies, in dissections. Uh, you'll see non-mucinous cells with a lipidic growth pattern very frequently, uh, you know, in either a component of other patterns or, or alone. But adenocarcinoma in situ should never be diagnosed on a small biopsy. All right, I'll repeat that. Adenocarcinoma in situ is defined in a way that it cannot be diagnosed in a small biopsy specimen. And by that I mean either a transbronchial biopsy or a needle biopsy or a cytology specimen or a, um, a core needle biopsy, you cannot diagnose adenocarcinoma in situ on those specimens. And I'll show you why, because the, the, the entity is defined in a way that needs a resected specimen. So this is the kind of thing that you should be, that people think about adenocarcinoma in situ, non-mucinous cells, just like I showed you before, lipidic growth pattern, 
there's no acinar growth or micropapillary or papillary. Next, please. So in 2016, if you see this in a small biopsy, my diagnosis for this kind of case, let's say this is a corneal biopsy, I just call it adenocarcinoma. What is your option? Next. You could do what the WHO says and say adenocarcinoma with lipidic pattern. That's about as far as you're allowed to go on a small biopsy. Do not, next please, do not call this adenocarcinoma in situ. Is that clear to everybody? Does everybody understand what a small biopsy means? It's not by size, it's just, you know, the biopsies that are taken by a radiologist or a bronchoscopist. If it's a surgically resected specimen, that's a different story. All right, so let's go to that. Now, if you see a resection specimen with the same growth pattern, your next question should be, is the entire tumor like this? Or are there other invasive growth patterns somewhere else? And depending on that, you can either call it adenocarcinoma in situ, that's AIS, minimally invasive adenocarcinoma, that's MIA, and lipidic predominant adenocarcinoma. And that is a one hour lecture on its own to tell to explain what those three are. But I'll, I'll briefly talk about adenocarcinoma in situ. So next please. So adenocarcinoma in situ, next Emily. So there's actually a set of criteria. You have to have a tumor that's three centimeters or less. If the tumor is five centimeters, you can't call it, just by definition. You have to have a non-mucinous proliferation. If the tumor is mucinous, like we described in the previous point, you cannot call it AIS. The third thing, you have to have looked at the entirely resected tumor. Now you guys know, right? In your template it says, if, you, if the mass is less than three centimeters, submit it entirely. Do you remember that in the, in the gross template? This is why. This is why we tell you to submit it entirely because to diagnose an adenocarcinoma in situ, you have to see the whole mass. What happens if you don't sample it entirely, just put in one? Well, it could be that the portion you left in, in the specimen had the invasive portion, right? It could be that there's an invasive pattern there and you're calling falsely calling it adenocarcinoma in situ. So for that reason, you must look at the entirely resected tumor. It has to be entirely submitted, which is like a two centimeter, um, a tumor probably takes a couple of sections <coughs> and you have to show that the entire tumor is lipidic. There should be no invasive patterns. In other words, if there's even a little bit of micropapillary growth or papillary, that's not AIS. That's an exclusion criteria. And finally, the WHO added this after 2011, that nuclear atypia should be absent or inconspicuous. In other words, if there is a lot of nuclear atypia, if it just looks like a very bad cytologically atypical tumor, I, I would not call it adenocarcinoma in situ. So there are many things that uh, make this a very strictly defined, very tight entity. And does anybody know why we are being so anal about this? Why are we so strict about the adenocarcinoma in situ diagnosis? Anyone? What is that? Prognosis. prognosis. And what is it about the prognosis that's different here? What's the prognosis? Much better than the Much better, yeah. So does anybody know what the five-year survival is of this? It's of almost this? 100%. Yes, that's correct. It's almost 100%. That's absolutely right. So this is a tumor that has nearly 100% survival. And if you want to be able to diagnose that in a reliable way, you have to follow these criteria. You cannot be doing that on a small biopsy specimen. All right. Any uh, Next, please. I think that's it for this one. Any questions, comments on endocarcinoma inside you? Chuck, anything to add from the cytology person? keeps putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I would add is in your choices where you, you had, you know, don't call it on a small biopsy, but you said you might say something like adenocarcinoma, lipidic growth pattern. Yes. I would have said, and maybe I'm saying too much, adenocarcinoma, lipidic growth pattern, low nuclear grade. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Because I think like in cytology or in little cores, you can say that and you're just saying what, what you see, but yes. you're not saying AIS. That's correct. So just to repeat it for our Periscope audience, uh, it's, it's perfectly legitimate and might actually be very helpful to actually say what the nuclear grade is to mention that either in the diagnosis or the comment, uh, and just, to, just to indicate that cytologically this looks like a low grade tumor. And that's, that's a very good point. But again, we should not be using the term adenocarcinoma in situ in any kind of small biopsy specimen or cytology. Okay, everybody all right with that? All right, so our next point is, um, now this we're we are, we are talking about uh, subtyping of non-small cell carcinomas that are poorly differentiated, all right? So we're talking about tumors that we can't tell on morphology whether that's adenocarcinoma or squamous. And I have noticed that a lot of people get this particular point wrong. So I'm trying to clarify this, all right? So all of you know that when a tumor is poorly differentiated and is a non-small cell carcinoma, we use two stains. What are the stains we use to subtype? 
TTF and P40, correct? Everybody knows that? And if, if it's clear cut, which I'll show you in a second, we, it, we make an easy diagnosis. But the problems happen when there's focal P63 or P40 staining, especially P63. And what I've, real, what I've realized is people think that because P63 is a squamous marker, a little bit of P63 means a little bit of squamous. That's not right. That's not at all right. It's not right that if there's a little bit of P63, there's a little bit of squamous, or the cells that have a little P63 are a little bit squamous. That's not right at all. To be for P63 or P40 to be true markers of squamous differentiation, they need to be diffusely and strongly pulsed. Okay, does everybody get that? It has to be. So let me make the point here. Here's a tumor that you can't really tell. You know, you can guess, but you can't really tell whether this is adeno or squamous. So let's go to the next one. Now, if you had this kind of a result, everybody would be happy with this, right? You'd say both the glandular markers are positive, both the squamous markers are negative, and so this is a uh, poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma, open and shut. Next, please. If you had the reverse result, you'd, that would also be easy, right? You'd say TTF and absent negative, um, P63 and CK56 positive. So this is clearly a poorly differentiated squamous. So next, please. So um, raise your hand how many people saw this case that I put out beforehand? Anyone? All right, I'm not going to reveal how many people actually saw this case. But they, I put this case out just so you guys could see why, why this can be difficult. So here's a tumor that looks like it should be squamous cell carcinoma. It's a very poorly diff, but it doesn't have glands, no mucin, no keratinization. It's not an easy one. So we stained this up and this is what we got. We got diffuse, strong TTF positivity. So it's a poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma. That's kind of surprising, but it is. Now look what happens with the P63. Let's go to the next one. This is the P63 pattern here. So now I've seen many people when they see this, they go, there's a little bit of P63. This is focal squamous or this is an adenosquamous carcinoma. That's the common mistake. They say, cannot rule out adenosquamous carcinoma. That is the wrong interpretation. So focal patchy P63 like this means nothing. It's just that some adenocarcinomas have focal P63 stain. That problem is much less with the P40, but it still can happen in a small proportion of cases. Next, in this particular case, we did the P40 and it's completely negative. And that's because P40 is a little more specific than P63. And you will have occasionally cases that are P63 focally positive and dead negative on the P40, proving that this is not a squamous. There's nothing squamous about this tumor. This is simply a adenocarcinoma with patchy P63 stain. All right, so is everybody okay with that? Everybody? So everybody okay on periscope with that? So the, the point here is not to misinterpret the uh, P63 staining in an, in an adenocarcinoma. All right, so there's 37 people watching on Periscope right now. Again, uh, just to tell you, we are broadcasting live. This is a lung pathology lecture, and it's free for everybody to watch. We're, we are on our last two points. So this point is, a, is one of the hardest. It's a, as you know, one of the hardest questions in pathology, one that you train for so many years for is benign versus malignant, right? And benign versus malignant can be a diagnostic challenge, but immunohistochemistry is not going to help there. All right, so if you are struggling with this question, is this a very low-grade adenocarcinoma or is this reactive epithelium, don't throw a bunch of immunostains on that. Show it to somebody and I'll show you many morphologic clues that can, that can help you on a biopsy specimen, on a search bath specimen, but immunohistochemistry is not the way to solve that this problem. Next, please. So this is the kind of tumor that I'm talking about. Some people will see this, especially um, experienced lung pathologists will see this and say adenocarcinoma, just easy. But I find that many people who don't look at a lot of lung find this kind of thing very distressing, you know? This is not an overtly malignant thing for some people. Next, please. Or this. Now, some might say, well, could this be something benign? Could this be a metaplasia? Could this be a reactive change? But this is actually adenocarcinoma. It's a very cytologically low-grade tumor. And, and in the past, people, when they saw this, they, they tried to explain the fact that they're struggling with it by saying things like, it has BAC features, or it's a kind of a low-grade bronchial alveolar carcinoma. So remember, that thing is gone. You can't talk about that anymore. So people go to another thing. They say, well, maybe this is a lipidic pattern. Well, it, it might be, but the basic question is really, is this benign or malignant? I mean, that's what we're really struggling with. So how do we sort that out? Next. So this problem is, is like I said, is a, is a big problem if, if the tumor cells are low-grade and especially if the growth pattern is lipidic. Stains don't help. 
and we are going to talk about clues for a malignant diagnosis. So all the pictures I'm going to show now are malignancy. These are adenocarcinomas. So what helps? So Emily, if you can point out the junction between the malignant proliferation and the benign here. So that when you have an abrupt junction, when the tumor just stops and normal lung begins, that's not a reactive feature, right? Reactive things kind of gradually blend from being reactive into surrounding lung. It doesn't just abruptly stop. So what's happened here is that this biopsy has sampled the edge of the lesion where the tumor interfaces with the normal. So this is a clue that you're dealing with a malignant process. Next. Now this looks very low grade. Actually, I struggled with this thing, this case a lot. But if you get columnar cells, remember again, columnar cells that don't have cilia, you have to be at least thinking malignancy. Now, can somebody name a normal cell in the lung that is columnar but doesn't have cilia? Or, What's that? Or, Clara cells are cuboidal, so that's the key. Clara cells are, certainly they don't have cilia, that's correct. But they are not columnar, so they're not tall. They are, they are uh, cuboidal, they're kind of dome-shaped. Anything else? There is one more cell that in the bronchus that can be Reduction. Reduction. Reserve cells are at the bottom. They're, you know, um, close to the basement membrane. Small cells. They're not columnar. How about goblet cells? Goblet cells. Goblet cells, right? They can be columnar. They don't have cilia. But goblet cells have mucin, right? So you can easily tell those apart. In fact, in the lung, there are no columnar cells that lack cilia. There are no columnar cells that lack cilia and are, are non-mucinous. You can have metaplasias that can do that. So in, in UIP, for example, you know, in interstitial lung diseases, you can have metaplastic chains that can be very florid and can involve some columnar cells. But if you see columnar cells that lack cilia, be very, very careful to call that benign. At least, at least, let me just say it like that. I'm not telling you to outright call it malignant, but at least suspect that it's benign. And there's a very big difference between having tufts of something decapitating from the surface and cilia. They're two completely different things. I often see people who see anything fuzzy at the surface of a cell and say that's ciliated, that's not, that's not true. So next, if you see nuclear crowding, so on a biopsy, reactive change, nuclei are usually widely spaced, or at least the nuclei don't touch each other. If they do touch each other, if they overlap on each other, that's a distressing finding, and you should be thinking malignancy there. Next. If the cell's stuffed into the air spaces, what pattern is that? It's micropapillary. It's micropapillary. Micropapillary is not a benign thing, right? There are, it's extraordinarily rare to get a micropapillary pattern in anything benign. Uh, so most of the time, this will be a malignant finding. In fact, not only is it malignant, it's an invasive pattern and it's a poor prognosis pattern. So this is a very helpful finding to see cells stuffing into the air spaces like that. All right, next. Here's another example of micropapillary growth pattern that establishes that something is malignant. So this establishes a malignant diagnosis. Cytologic atypia, of course we, we look at that, but you know this is in the eye of the beholder. Everybody has different thresholds as to what is cytologically atypical, but of, of course we use that. That's one of the, the key features in determining something is malignant or not. Next. And what I find really, really helpful, I think is the single most important feature is look for cilia, all right? If you see cilia on a cell, that is a benign process. At least that cell is benign. You might have malignant cells next to it, but the, the cell with the cilia is always benign. All right, so people have tried in the literature to prove that you can have malignancies that are ciliated. Sure, you know, it's extraordinarily rare, extraordinarily rare. It just does, it doesn't help to even think of it. You should be thinking if, if a cell has cilia on it, it's benign. And conversely, if a cell doesn't have cilia on it, you should start thinking, could this be malignant? At least think of it, right? You don't have to, every time some, you see a non-ciliated cell jump on it and call it malignant, but at least you should be thinking, right? That should make you think. All right, next. All right, so this is my conclusion of this, that reactive change versus bland adenocarcinoma is a thing all of you will face. You will face cases like this where you're trying to decide something is benign or malignant, and the features that I outlined before are helpful features, but these are all h &E features. They are not immunohistochemistry features. And when you guys are in, out in practice and you get a difficult case like this, it's probably a good idea to send that out for consultation rather than, you know, throw two trays of immunostains on it. Um, Chuck, anything that you can add from like the cytology point of view or things that you use for benign versus malignant other than? No, I think everything you said is applies to cytology. To cytology Just too. a different preparation. 
All right, that's great. Any questions from the residents before we go to the last? We're actually doing app great on time. Is it really? It's 8.30? Yeah. Wow. I was, so I've done a one hour lecture in half an hour. I'm going too fast, I think. All right, so let's talk. We'll have time, time to talk about the most interesting thing, which is this. And this is going to be our last must-know fact for the day. Um, so th the fact here is, in 2016, lots of things have changed, right? Lots of molecular things have changed. Things are still changing. And you guys must know at least the basics of what we need for molecular diagnosis, in the, in the United, at least in the United States and in this institution. So the, the point I'm trying to make here is, if you get a lung adenocarcinoma, an adenocarcinoma of the lung, you should always be thinking in your head, what else does it need besides just the diagnosis, right? So does it need molecular testing? Does it need additional immunohistochemistry for treatment? And in 2016, you should at least be aware of these four things, right? I'll show you a pie chart with, with literally dozens and dozens of markers. Every day you hear of a new marker. But these four you must know, because these are going to be big in your lifetime as you practice. So the first two are EGFR and ALK. Hopefully all of you have already heard of these, right? EGFR and ALK has become pretty much standard in the United States and elsewhere. We must test a lung cancer at least when it's metastatic. And adenocarcinoma must be tested for EGFR and ALK. In our institution, we do EGFR by next generation sequencing, which is, you know, or, or the PCR equivalent. And we do ALK by immunohistochemistry. So we start first by using the D5F3 ultra-sensitive ALK antibody. And then if the ALK is negative, we stop. If the ALK is positive or equivocal, then we go to ALK fish, right? So we start with immunohistochemistry. Many people do it differently, and all of those are valid approaches, but we do EGFR by NGS and ALK by uh, immunohistochemistry. The second thing you guys should know about is ROS1. So ROS1 is a relatively recently described thing, but this is also targetable. It's a targetable mutation uh, rearrangement because it can be targeted by a drug called crizotinib. Now, what is crizotinib use, usually used for? Anyone? Oh. For ALK rearranged tumors. That's correct. So the same drug that's used for ALK rearranged tumors is also used now for, it's actually approved for um, ROS rearranged tumors. So, and it's a lot of the same demographics, never smokers, women, you know, younger people. So they also get ROS rearranged, um, uh, ROS rearrangements. It's a little bit less common than ALK and EGFR, and I'll show you a pie chart later to show you which ones are the most common. And finally, the thing you should know about is PDL1. Raise your hands, anybody who has heard of PDL1 before? Let's see. Okay, now raise your hands, those who have not heard of PDL1 yet. Be honest, nobody, nobody, they can't see you. <laughs> All right, so PDL1, I'll tell you, is huge. It's like a tsunami, you know? You see it coming, you don't really, you know, it doesn't really look like a big deal when it's far away. Then it comes, it looks bigger as it's coming. By the time you realize what's happening, it, you will be washed away by it. This thing is huge. So this thing is immunotherapy, which is coming down the pike, and I'll show you what something really huge happened last month, which I'm going to share with you. So PDL1 is a, is a, um, uh, is a molecule, is a, a protein that's expressed on the surface of tumor cells, right? So lung cancer cells, um, some lung cancer cells express this tumor on their surface, and what it does is it keeps away the immune system. So it keeps the immune system away from tumor cells. So it, it helps in immune evasion, right? So tumor cells help use this like a defense. Now what people have done is they figured out a way to inhibit the PDL1. So once that's inhibited, the immune system just attacks the tumor. Does everybody get that idea? So this is called immunotherapy or, or uh, checkpoint inhibitors. So what they do, uh, they use PDL1 inhibitors or PD1 inhibitors or, or uh, that kind of immunotherapy to treat tumors. Now people who have been um, using this for melanoma know this for many years. For melanoma, this has been used. And there are many drugs available. There's pembrolizumab, nivolumab, many that are coming down the pike. But this is becoming a huge hot topic. Virtually every meeting that you go to, people are going to be talking about PD-1, PDL-1. So you should be very familiar with this, and I'm going to show you why. Next, please. So the scenario where this kind of thing will be useful is like a elderly individual has metastases to the liver, bones, and brain. Uh, you find by morphology that it's adenocarcinoma. 
maybe in a metastatic site you do some immunohistochemistry like in a bone for example you'll do TTF it's positive vaccinate is negative so you're comfortable the patient has a lung mass you say okay this is a met from the lung so do we stop there is that is our responsibility over no that's now in 2016 our things just starts there for, in terms of treatment so next so this is the kind of thing you'll see right very busy slide but what it's showing you is all the drivers that we now know in um, lung cancer. So this was actually shared on Twitter by Dr. Lara Pihuan, who is a um, pulmonary pathologist from Barcelona. I, I love this pie chart. It's just beautifully because it not only shows the drivers, it also shows the treatment agents that are associated with them. And it shows you the level of evidence. So for example, uh, where it says four for gefitinib, do you guys see that at the top left? That means for a tumor that has an EGFR mutation, you could use gefitinib to treat that, and that is level four, meaning that the, it's approved for use in the United States. It's currently used. So on the other hand, if you go to RET, for example, um, Emily, if you go to RET, that's only 2%, and you see that little box there, you see cabozantinib. So that's in phase two trials. Two means phase two. In fact, some of the studies have been done here at this institution. We described some of the earlier uh, RET uh, inhibited cases. We showed that they can respond to cabozantinib, but a lot of these drugs are in early phases, but some of them are approved. So the ones that are approved are EGFR sensitizing, um, uh, the drugs targeted to EGFR sensitizing mutations, drug tar targets against um, uh, ALK rearrangements up there, Emily, at the top, and then um, drugs against ROS1. So those are level four evidence, meaning the FDA has approved of them. The others are probably going to come into use at some point but you guys should know at least EGFR and ALK. So which is the most common driver, guys, from this pie chart? Yeah. KRAS, right? Mm -hmm. So what's the drug against that? No. There's none. At least at the current time, there's no drug. We do test for KRAS. Many other people test one, you know, there, there are other uses other than um, targeted therapy. But one thing it tells you is, if you have a KRAS mutation, you won't have anything else because these are all mutually exclusive. In other words, you can't have two of these. So if you have KRAS in your tumor, you will not have any of the others. So in that way, it's helpful to know that you have a KRAS mutation. There are also other uses in determining METs and you know synchronous primaries and all that, but we won't go into that. So is everybody clear about this, drivers? One more last point I'll make here is that you'll see the, the blue part of the pie, 31% of lung adenocarcinomas don't have a known driver. So still, there is a big chunk of tumors. Actually, um, I, I thought just a few years ago it, that was closer to 50%, is that a, a, really a big chunk of lung adenocarcinomas don't have a known driver. So they, in the past, they would just get standard chemotherapy, cisplatin, pemetrexid, or some kind of, you know, some kind of uh, platinum-based chemotherapy. Yes. I have a question. I mean, sure. In him, we have a similar thing about mutual exclusive cytogenetics. Yes. Or Aberrations. Yes. Any trend of dividing these uh, adenocarcinoma and you refer to as cytogenetic report with KRS mutation? Yeah, yeah. That's a so great question. Yes. Kind of doing this yes. You know that he's a heme guy because he asked this question. <laughs> but it's a very good question. You know, it's the next step, right? You, yes. Yes. Because in heme path, certainly you have that, right? You you say now AML driven by this mutation, and uh, so that's certainly a good question. So far, the WHO hasn't done that, so they haven't said. Here are EGFR, here, here's a chapter on EGFR driven adenocarcinoma. Here's a chapter on ALK driven adenocarcinoma. It hasn't happened, but I can see that in the future that might be, yeah, it might go down that way. Now remember, uh, in some ways lung is behind the heme in the sense that heme has gone already to molecular. Lung just came into immunohistochemistry, you know? So we have, we have just, we have just uh, accepted in our classification that immunohistochemistry should be used for typing. Before that we used to say no. It's all H&E, it's all morphology. So we are a little behind in that sense, but that's a good question. It, it might be coming in the future. Any, any other questions about drivers? All right, so let me talk about this because this is really the most fascinating thing to me. And you guys should know, just try to understand the importance of this finding. So on October 24th, just last month, right? The FDA, which is, you know, they approve all these uh, important drugs. They approved pembrolizumab, which is an immunotherapy drug a checkpoint inhibitor, pembrolizumab, for first line treatment, meaning the first drug that somebody with cancer gets, of metastatic non-small cell carcinoma with high PDL expression. Now what that means is, let's say you have somebody with a brain met, okay? 
and we know that this is lung cancer. We did the, the TTF and all that. We proved it. Now, the next step on, in this kind of a study would be to do a PDL1 immunohistochemical stain on this. And uh, that immunohistochemical stain is considered positive if it's membrane, if it shows membrane staining in tumor cells. And in this particular study, uh, any intensity membrane staining by immunohistochemistry was considered positive. And if more than 50% of tumor cells showed that staining, and they were given uh, this checkpoint inhibitor pembrolizumab, they did better, I'll repeat this, they did better than standard chemotherapy. That's a huge advance in lung cancer, you know? We've, so in other words, what you're saying is they got only a checkpoint inhibitor versus the, the other arm got standard chemotherapy that we have been giving for many decades to these people. And the people that got the checkpoint inhibitor had better progression-free survival. And it seems like possibly better overall survival. And the side effects were less too. So there were less serious side effects on the, the immunotherapy arm than on the, uh, uh, on, the, on the chemotherapy arm. So based on this, this is really the first time the FDA has approved a checkpoint inhibitor for first line treatment of lung cancer. And you can imagine what a big deal this is, right? Can you imagine like just a couple of months ago, if my uncle had lung cancer, I'd say, oh my God, that's, you know, you don't have an EGFR or an ALF mutation. You're, you go to chemotherapy and all, the, the, all that that means. Now, that same person would, would possibly get a checkpoint inhibitor if they had high pdl one expression. So this is going to be a huge deal. This will mean that we need to, we need to test these tumors for pdl one by immunostochemistry. Um, uh, there's a lot of discussion, so this is evolving very rapidly. There are some drugs like nivolumab that potentially can be given without any testing. So those, there is some data to show that you, you, you can give some of these drugs without any pdl one testing and there's some benefit for those patients. And there's a lot of fighting about, um, within lung, in the lung community, what the cutoff should be. Should it be 1%, should it be 5%, should it be 50%, should there be no cutoff, what should be evaluated, tumor cells or immune cells, but whatever the, the specifics are, immunotherapy is coming. And by the time you guys are practicing, this will become, all of you will, will have to deal with this. Do you know when we're gonna start doing PDL1? Yeah, so PDL1, we are going to bring this in-house at some point, but you know, this stuff has to settle down a little bit. We, we have to understand which drugs are going to be coupled with which, and that's part of the problem. You know, you don't want to be bringing in a different platform for every different, uh, you know, PDL1 drug, which is currently what's happening. Every drug is, is associated with something else. But chances are we will have to bring this in-house and we will have to do this testing here for, for virtually every metastatic non-sponsored lung cancer. Yes. Yeah, so it's similar to her to new. It's not not nearly as, as advanced or standardized as her to new is. But that's that is really the the best comparison here. You know, her to new we use that for therapeutic purposes, and because it's used for therapy, you know, people are are very very concerned that this needs to be standardized. You know, it's not like reading a P sixty three or a P forty. It needs to be standardized. Everybody needs to be on the same page. People will be denied drugs because they don't have expression of this. So that's that's a huge deal. And some people are worried because some of the studies show that even if you don't have PDL1 expression, some small proportion of patients will respond to these. So some people are, are worried that we are needlessly excluding some patients based on PDL1 expression. That's and that's a valid concern. So that's going to shake itself out over the next year or a couple of years. But whichever way it shakes out, we will we will need to know about this. I didn't need to know about this as a resident, but you guys will need to know. Chuck, any comments about this? Is it, it's coming to cytology soon too, I'm sure, but not, not yet. Well, there are, there are many um, you know, high-end cytology practices that are already doing this. Right. I think you know, one of the things that is challenging is each drug is kind of their, their FDA approval, and this is like what Sanjay was alluding to, is tied to a specific diagnostic test. And often it's like the company who is making the drug, like let's say there's a pd one drug that's being marketed by Roche. Roche owns Ventana. So they will want you to use a Ventana product to do the lab testing to determine whether or not the patient will qualify for their drug and their FDA approval will be based on the combination of that specific antibody testing and that drug. So there might be, you know, six commercially available PD PD L1 or PD1A antibodies 
And the, the struggle would be, well, if the oncologist wants uh, an armamentarium and they want to do, be able to prescribe, you know, four of those six drugs, then you might seriously have to contemplate having four different tests because you would do the tests that they want to know will the drug respond. And the issue would be that these drugs are hugely expensive. Yeah. The drug could cost between ten and twenty thousand dollars a month. So if you're talking, you know, over two hundred thousand dollars a year for maintenance therapy, no uh, third party payer will pay for that unless you can document that there's a likelihood the patient will respond. So it's not just you know knowing the, the understanding the science. It's there's a lot of kind of politics and money behind it. And so I think the thing is is you would have to know what anti PDL one drugs are going to be prescribed before you would decide which antibodies you would validate in your laboratory. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. I think the the <laughs> corollary of that would be. Just imagine in your head if there were five different HER2 antibodies yeah. and five different drug companies had their own, you know, their own agenda and their own marketing as to how you would use, which HER2 you could use with which machine. And it, it would be so complicated that, that it, would, it would be unusable. So that, that's the situation now with this. It has to get easier and, you know, more widely. And some of the drugs that are out there are, they're, they're based not only off of reading the percentage score with the tumor cells, but also reading the percentage of the immune cells that are in the slide, like yeah. lymphoid background, yeah. um, which, you know, is, if you think that's challenging in histology, that could be even more challenging in cytology. True. And they're diagnosing many of these patients, especially people who are presenting with metastatic disease on tiny little biopsies or FNAs, because all they want to do is confirm that it's a malignancy, right. and then they want you to do all this magic off of that sample, which could be difficult. That's correct. That's correct. Any any questions, guys? So, do you guys uh, understand this thing, the concept of immunotherapy? That there are there are these drugs available. They're coming down the pike. Any questions about anything in this talk about adenocarcinoma in general? Anyone? There are actually 48 people on Periscope who are watching live right now. So it's you guys and them. Everybody is learning together. It's, it's really a, a helpful way to teach everyone. So we started to pass the PDL1 right now? Or? Yes, so our current thing is we are sending out our PDL1 testing for every new diagnosis in cancer case. Every new diagnosis case. So it's, it's, a, really big, it's a really big issue. Any other questions? I have one more comment, sure. Sanjay, yeah. not to talk. No, no, please. If anybody has questions, that's more important. I think that one thing is, is you know, we decide we're going to do all these um, biomarkers on new every new lung adenocarcinoma, and that's that's true. But sometimes these patients are you know 90 years old, and they have many comorbidities, and they and their families may not want to pursue all these tests. So I think it's it's good to keep in mind that when we say we're doing it on all patients, there could be patients for in which we're not doing anything. And that you have to discuss with the patient's care team. But if you do that, one thing to keep in mind is, like say the patient is being seen by a hospitalist or a primary care doctor, and they say, you know, we've discussed this with the patient and the patient doesn't want to pursue additional therapy because they have, they're 90 and they have comorbidities and they've had a great life. Well, I think a lot of times the patients don't realize that these drugs many times are oral, they have very minimal side effects, and they could prolong their lives by years. Um, so when they say, you know, we're not going to do anything, they may not be informed, I'm meaning the physicians. And often what I see is in the last month I've had two cases in which I've diagnosed new lung cancers in fluids, and I've called, taken the time, and talked to the clinical care team and they've said don't do anything because the patient wants to go to hospice and then they get a medical oncology consult just because they want to you know kind of cover all bases and the medical oncologist explained to them you know if your tumor is one of these tumors that maybe we could do a lot for you with very minimal risk taking a, one pill a day with no uh, significant potential side effects, these people are already taking a lot of pills, they don't mind taking one more pill. And if it can give them, you know, four years of high quality life, 
that may happen. So you, you have to kind of get a little bit involved in each patient. That's great. Yeah, that's a great discussion. I actually agree with all of that. The similar thing happened with EGFR and ALK when we were deciding yeah. what to test right. and whom to test. All of those are great points. Yeah. Anybody else? We all set? All right. Thank you very much for coming, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you the, uh, our audience on Periscope. Thank you very much for joining. We'll archive this and we'll post it on YouTube so anybody can watch it at any point down the line. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for attending. Thank you, Chuck. <laughs>